10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Broadcasting live worldwide. Click, listen, enjoy. Thank you for tuning in to GCN Talk Line Network Radio, America's number one Jewish program. The Talk Line Communications Network proudly presents its flagship program, Talk Line, America's number one Jewish program, the pulse beat of the Jewish community, with Zeb Brenner. And now, your host, Zeb Brenner. And welcome to another edition of Talk Line. I'm Zev Brenner. Very pleased to be with you here tonight on WOR 710 AM. And we got a very special broadcast for you. But before I do that, let me just remind everybody that we're here with you every Sunday night from 9 to 10 p.m. on 710 AM. The rest of the time, Monday through Wednesday night, you can catch us on from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's on WSNR 620 AM. Same station Thursday night from 7 p.m. till 11 p.m. Saturday nights, World Jewish, all Saturday nights from 9 p.m. till 4 a.m. Again, all on WSNR 620 AM in New York. Online, talklinenetwork.com, our 24-hour day listen line, 641-741-0389. We're on Naki Radio. 24 hours a day. Tonight, by popular request, we had him two weeks ago, but people saying, when are you putting Alan Dershowitz back on the air? Well, we're going to speak to Alan Dershowitz about what the prospects for the president has in the courts. Can the courts revive or help Donald Trump hold on to the presidency? That'll be our topic of conversation tonight. Of course, we'll take your phone calls and your emails, and you'll have a chance to chime in. With a note of sadness, I did also want to acknowledge the passing of one of the Torah leaders of the generation, Rabbi David Feinstein of blessed memory, whose funeral was today, and also Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, also an outstanding Torah scholar. Both of them passed away. May their memories be a blessing. We begin our broadcast right after these messages. Stay tuned. If you have been suffering with fatigue, pain, gastrointestinal problems, anxiety, brain fog, weight gain, and have been to doctors who haven't found the answers, the Kelman Wellness Center can help. Best-selling medical author Dr. Raphael Kelman, a holistic medical doctor and internist, specializes in unexplained complex health issues. Dr. Kelman finds the root cause of your illness. Through advanced testing methods and a combination of traditional and holistic healing methods, he has helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call the Kelman Wellness Center at 833-MD-HELP-ME for more information about how Dr. Kelman can help you feel your best. That's 833-MD-HELP-ME. Learn more about the Kelman Wellness Center at kelmancenter.com. Call now for your free 10-minute consultation. That number again, 833-MD-HELP-ME. That's 833-MD-HELP-ME. When my garage door wouldn't work, who did I call? I called Mordechai at H&O Garage Doors because Mordechai is a specialist not only in fixing garage doors. They do low-priced garage door tune-ups, but they actually put in garage doors. They have a 24-hour emergency service, and they offer high quality at fair prices. The winter inspection is only $59, great value. So do what I did. Call Mordechai at 718-710-6468. That's 718-710-6468. Senior citizens get 10% off, and, of course, Mordechai will gladly give you a free estimate. Again, for all garage door service and needs, repair and installation, call H&O Garage Doors at 718-710-6468. Again, 718-710-6468. All the work is guaranteed, and they are licensed. Tell Mordechai that Zev sent you.
COVID-19 cases are on the rise in our community. To help prevent the spread of COVID-19, stay home and only leave for essentials if you are sick. When you go out, practice physical distancing. Wear a face covering. Wash your hands often with soap and water. Avoid large indoor gatherings of people. Get tested. You will not be fined for testing positive. For more information or to find the testing site, call 311. Have you been worried that your child's college preparation is suffering due to the pandemic? Online learning can be especially difficult for students preparing for the SAT and ACT as these tests present unique challenges. Luckily, Beyond the Test Tutoring and College Prep is here to help your child succeed. While many educators have struggled adapting to online learning, our educators have been tutoring online since 2013 and have mastered an effective and enriching program to help students succeed by teaching them the best strategies and tips for taking the test. The On the Test's approach is tried and true and has resulted in 100% five-star reviews for our program. Our incredible program is taught by the owners to provide your child the very best our company has to offer. We know these uncertain times have been difficult for everyone. However, Beyond the Test Tutoring and College Prep is fully prepared to help your child with any and all needs to make sure they do their very best on these exams. For personal services, please call 856-240-0728 or visit us online at beyondthetest.com. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner. It's always a treat, always a privilege to have with us Harvard Law Professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz. Uh, He has his finger on the pulse, especially the legal pulse. He knows what's going on. And we're going to be examining the election and what options legally does the president, uh, Donald J. Trump, have as far as trying to pursue to maintain his hold on the presidency. I might add that in addition to everything else, he's a prolific writer, and uh, you can catch his podcast. It's called The Dur Show. It's on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube, and his new book is called Guilt by Association. Professor Alan Dersha, thank you for joining us again. Well, thanks. The name of the book is actually Guilt by Accusation. Accusation. I it's keep saying fact, association. Right. It's about the fact that some people think I am guilty of having had sex with a woman who I never met in my life. And the thesis of the book is that today with the Me Too movement, if you're accused, you're guilty. In my case, and I documented in the book, I found emails from her, which she tried to suppress, in which she admits she never met me. I found the manuscript of a book she wrote in which she admits she never met me. She says she saw me once. I have a tape recording by her lawyer um, in which he admits that she was wrong, simply wrong, and I couldn't possibly have met her. I have an investigation by the former head of the FBI who concluded that I couldn't have been in the places she said she met me, but she's accused me, she's accused Leslie Wexner, she's accused George Mitchell, the former majority leader of the Senate, Bill Richardson, Ehud Barak, everybody who was in Jeffrey Epstein's Rolodex, she's accused, and with the help of her lawyer, she is engaged in extortion and perjury, and we're going to have a trial, and hopefully she'll end up in prison and her lawyers will end up disbarred. But uh, to me, the most disturbing thing, and that's why I wrote the book, is that the 92nd Street Y, a Jewish institution uh, which features prominent speakers, for 25 years they've had me speak. I've been the second most popular speaker after Elie Wiesel. And when I wrote my book called In Defending Israel, A Whole Defense of Israel, they canceled me. They refused to allow me to speak they, because I was accused. They said they know I didn't do it. They know I'm innocent. But because I'm accused, they don't want trouble. And I think everybody should boycott the 92nd Street. Why? They're engaging in horrible conduct, not allowing a Jewish speaker to speak on behalf of Israel. They allow every anti-Israel speaker, whoever wants to come forward, to speak. And they've encouraged BDS speakers, anti-Israel speakers. But the 92nd Street Y will not allow me to make a speech in defense of Israel. And that's a scandal. And, you know, they're funded by the Jewish Federation. And uh, yet they suppress the free speech of pro-Israel speakers based on false accusations. It's pure McCarthyism, and they should be ashamed of themselves. And anybody who has anything to do with the 92nd Street Y should disassociate. Isn't that the tenor of the times where, with the suppression of information, I think we saw that the New York Post claimed that with the Hunter Biden investigation that they had, that Twitter suppressed them. Isn't that the tenor of the times that if they don't like an opinion, they suppress it? Of course. I mean, I have another book coming out soon called Cancel Culture, the newest attack on freedom of speech is due process. If you don't like what somebody is saying, it's 
free speech for me, but not for thee. And if you are expressing views, and in my case, it wasn't even views. I wasn't expressing views that were unpopular. I was supporting Israel. But because of the accusation, the 92nd Street Y wouldn't allow me to speak. Look, college campuses have canceled me and banned me because of the accusation. So I can't defend Israel on college campuses. And with all due modesty, I think I was one of the most articulate defenders of Israel on college campuses, especially since I wrote the case for Israel. But part of the reason for this accusation is to try to silence my voice on Israel, which is why I'm fighting back. I'm fighting back on my behalf, on behalf of everybody who's ever been falsely accused, and also on behalf of my own voice on behalf of Israel. So, I, you know, I'm going to win this case, but at the moment I'm 82 years old, and it's taking time out of my life to have to defend myself. You know, in 50 years of teaching at Harvard, I was never accused of anything improper. I've never sued anybody. I've never been sued. And suddenly this woman comes along for money. She's accused Al Gore, Tipa Gore, Bill Clinton, you name them. She's accused everybody. And yet people believe her, even though she has no credibility and is a proven liar. Well, good luck. And I, and I think in today's day and age, unfortunately, you can say anything you want and it gets picked up and they get away with it, unfortunately. Well, but you can read my book free. It's, um, I made it available free. I waived all my uh, royalties to make it available free on Kindle so that anybody who wants to read the truth can just get the book and read it. And you'll see the evidence is there. Uh, The tape recordings, the emails, it's all laid out. It's all documented. Nobody could have any doubt that this is a woman I never met. And, uh, you know, uh, I I have had sex with one woman during the relevant period of time, my wife. And everybody who knows me knows that. But this woman just decided to make up a story in order to destroy my credibility in my life. And I'm not going to let her get away with it. And we hope that you're successful and you keep us posted about that. I'm sure that it's aggravating and takes up a lot of your time and effort. And uh, hopefully that will, will speedily be adjudicated. Yeah. What about the president of the United States? He's filing lawsuits in different venues. Does he have a chance of, of, of success? He's claiming fraud. He's claiming that irregularities took place in different polling places. He claims that the numbers have been, you know, that the election is being stolen from him. What legal recourse does he have, realistically? Well, it depends. Every state is different. In Pennsylvania, he has a very substantial chance of winning. Why? Pennsylvania has legislation that says in order for your mail-in vote to be counted, it has to have been received by the voting people before the close of business on Election Day. And then the Supreme Court of the state, the state Supreme Court, expanded, expanded that three days. And the Constitution says, however, that only the state legislature could determine rules for voting. So if he brought that case, and he is bringing it uh, with Rudy Giuliani and Pam Bondi and some very good lawyers, bringing it to the United States Supreme Court, they may very well rule in his favor and not count any of the write-in votes that were received after the close of business on Election Day. Now, will that be enough to give him victory in Pennsylvania? That's the question. We don't know how many of those ballots have now been segregated at the demand of Justice Alito of the Supreme Court. If the number of ballots cast late, or at least received late, exceed the difference, the margin by which uh, Biden beat Trump in Pennsylvania, then they may have to shift Pennsylvania over to the uh, Trump column. Is that going to be enough? Well, it depends on what happens then in Nevada, in uh, Georgia, where there'll be a recount, and in Arizona. And unless he can win more than one state, won't, one state won't reverse the election. But if he were able to win two or three states, then he would have a chance. If you're asking me to predict the likely outcome, I think the likely outcome is the election result will not be changed. But some of the voting in some of the states may conceivably be changed. But in the end, if you ask me to make a prediction, it is that on January 20th, 2021, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th president. Well, it's certainly very hard to get the courts in all the... First of all, there's no standard, election standard, in every state. Every state is different, and maybe there should be a federal standard. Well, that would require a constitutional amendment, because the Constitution says in Article 2 
that the state legislatures determine the rules for electing electors. Look, the whole issue of whether the Electoral College still makes sense in the 21st century is, is up for debate, but it's in the Constitution. And so it can't be changed by legislation, even if the Democrats were to get control of the Senate and the House and uh, the presidency. It's still not likely that they can change that without a constitutional amendment, which I don't think is in the offing. Now, Pennsylvania say he has the best shot, but is it the same theory that's being used in all the other states that he's challenging, that it's voter fraud, they not allow, they didn't allow their monitors in, um, that their the votes, the ballots came in post when they shouldn't, it's not been postmarked and still been accepted? Is that the legal basis that they have? Every state has a different challenge, and some states are wholesale challenges. Pennsylvania, it's a wholesale challenge. If you win on that point, you get all of the votes that came in after Election Day discounted. In other states, like Nevada, the challenge is retail. Well, this person may have been dead. This person may have moved out of the state. This person may have been fraud. In this particular voting area, they didn't allow people to come close enough. That will require trials, and trials take time, and you only know the result after you've heard all the evidence. So it's much less likely that he will win when he's making retail challenges than when he's making wholesale constitutional challenges. But he's lucky. He has very good lawyers working for him. And uh, if there is a, a chance, uh, the courts, you know, the courts, a lot of the judges have been appointed by him and confirmed by a Republican Senate, including the Supreme Court of the United States. So if he has plausible legal arguments, the courts are very likely to side with him, as they did with the Republican candidate in 2000 during Bush versus Gore. But the question is whether the numbers are sufficient to bring him a victory, even if he wins in court. And at the moment, that doesn't seem likely unless there are recounts that produce somewhat different numerical results. Now, in 2000, when the Gore situation took place, didn't the court, the Supreme Court show reticence from getting involved? They did, but they ultimately did get involved. I was a lawyer in that case. I represented the voters of Palm Beach County. You may remember what happened there. They had a butterfly ballot, and a lot of Jewish voters accidentally voted for Pat Buchanan, who is a virulent anti-Semite, instead of Joe Lieberman. What happened is the poll, which you press for Joe Lieberman, he wasn't running for president, but him and Al Gore was in the place that if you press that and put in that number or that that filled in that blank, you ended up voting for Pat Buchanan. And uh, believe me, the Jews of Palm Beach County didn't vote for Pat Buchanan, but he got hundreds of votes, which could have made the difference in the election. The court was reticent, but it eventually got involved. And in a five to four decision along strictly party lines, ruled in favor of Bush. I wrote a book about it called Supreme Injustice, where I railed against the majority saying if the shoe had been on the other foot, if it had been Bush versus Gore and Bush were trying to stop the recount, it's not so clear to me, and Bush were trying to have the recount, rather, and Gore were trying to stop it, it wasn't clear to me that the court would have ruled the same way. Look, courts are political. They're human beings. They're appointed by politicians. So don't be surprised if judges sometimes vote uh, in court the way they voted in the ballot box. Now, they're saying that Judge Amy uh, should recuse herself uh, if it ever gets to the Supreme Court. Should a judge recuse him or herself because they were appointed by the president? Well, she'll have to make that decision. There's no review from her decision. The Supreme Court justices make their own decision. There's a statute that says a judge should recuse herself if there is an appearance of bias or the likelihood of bias and those are vague criteria. She has a 40-year career in front of her. She may well decide that she doesn't want to taint her legacy by casting the deciding vote in favor of a president who just appointed her and who said basically that he was appointing her because he wanted a full Supreme Court to decide election cases. So nobody knows whether she'll recuse herself. If I had to make a prediction or a guess, I would say probably not. We're speaking with Harvard Law Professor Emeritus, the one and only Alan Avi Dershowitz. So you can catch his podcast called The Dersh Show. 
I like calling you Avi Dershowitz. So I hope you don't mind. <laughs> uh, no, I appreciate it. You know, my, my, my son kids me about it. He's the producer of the show. He says it's the Dersh show. The only thing it's missing is the wits. And the wits is provided by the callers because I get callers. I have guests. I had Megan Kelly. Uh, I had, uh, let's see, um, uh, David Rubin. I'm having uh, Shapiro call. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of very good guests. So, uh, and I take calls. And it's a lot of fun. So if you want to listen, uh, it's on every day, every weekday. Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. And as the professor mentioned, his latest book is called Guilt by Accusation. We're going to be right back. Don't go away. Stay tuned. TCN Talk Live Network Radio, America's number one Jewish program. Okay, before I send, let's go to Rudy in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Go ahead, Rudy. Um, so I have a question. Uh, they, uh, I read in one of the um, news stories that I saw that there were somewhere like 450,000 votes uh, uh, that only uh, they only voted for uh, president for Joe Biden. They didn't vote for any of the other issues on the or people on the ballot. Do you think that's indication of uh, any problems with uh, voting or fraud? No, I think a lot of people vote only for the president. I mean, I got my ballot, my mail. I voted every year since 1960. Personally, this is the first year I voted by mail because I'm 82 years old. And obviously, I don't want to go to the polling booth. And I vote in Florida. And I, I don't know most of the people on the ballot. They were judges and they were, uh, you know, clerks and magistrates and uh, you name it. I, I did vote for everybody, but a lot of people just fill in the presidential uh, vote. And no, I don't think that indicates uh, necessarily fraud. But every every contested vote should be challenged and should be tested. Um, and that's why we have recounts. That's why we have rules involving poll watchers uh and you know, democracy requires that we have valid, valid voting, and I hope that everything is checked carefully. But um, my my guess is that in the end, this election will go the way the networks have called it. But do you think this? There, go ahead, Rudy. Do you, is there any truth to uh, uh, to the story that the um, that the company that does the software is um, uh, controlled or partially owned by? Uh, Diane Feinstein's husband and Nancy Pelosi's <laughs> chief, of, chief of staff. It's where it's obviously a rumor, and people should look into it. Um, and uh, you know, let's see. There are so many rumors circulating, but let's not re- let rumors uh, determine uh, democracy. Let's let the facts determine democracy. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, sure. for your phone. Here's an email question. Uh, you are a lifelong Democrat. Do you believe those principles dearest to a robust free amendment, free speech rights are more associated with the Republican Party? Yes, I do, because uh, for a very obvious reason, on college campuses, particularly, it's conservatives and Republicans whose speech is being uh, repressed. When I was growing up, it was the opposite. I grew up during McCarthyism and it was the Democrats and the and the people on the left that supported free speech. Today, it's Republicans, conservatives and people on the right that support free speech. And it's part of a phenomenon, which I talk about free speech for me, but not for thee. People support, support free speech if it's on their side. But to be a real supporter of free speech, you have to defend free speech for your enemies as well as for your friends. Okay, let us go to Levy and Woodmere. Go ahead, Levy and Woodmere. Yeah, hi, I was wondering about something for a little bit. I was curious if you'd think, by every other president, the people who support him support him, and if he loses, that's it. Trump is a culture. It's more like a, I wouldn't call it a cult, but there are Trumpers who live for Trump. Someone was telling me he went to a rally and he had to leave. He felt like it was a white desire. Like, how do you think these Trumpers will react when, if he, if he, if the court society he, he loses? W- will it be a revolution? What will happen? Because these are angry people. What's going to... Well, there would have been anger on both sides. If uh, Trump had won, uh, we might have seen anger, uh, protests, maybe even violence. Uh, we know that New York City boarded up its uh, stores in Manhattan, and in Manhattan, you're not really worried so much about Trump supporters as you are about uh, Trump haters. So there could be threats of violence on either side. I hope that, you know, whatever the final result is, it will be accepted by all sides. Uh, I think that um, uh, Al Gore, I'm sorry, that Joe Biden did a good job last night in his speech when he did talk about conciliation and compromise and 
and give us a chance. Uh, you know, I understand there's anger on the part of those who lost the election. He said he lost many elections. I hope that whoever loses does what Al Gore did and concedes or what uh, what even Richard Nixon did back in 1960 in a hotly contested election and, and conceded to everything. There's a season and there's a season for fighting and protesting and campaigning. And there's also a season for saying, you know, it's over and let's resume the process of ruling democratically. So I hope that's what happens. Thank you for your phone call. Our number is at 212-769-1925. Here's another one from the five towns. Uh, let's see. Sarah writes, in any event, regardless of state's outcome, Trump will not reverse the outcome. What's the point of all the effort, expense, and division? Well, we don't know. We don't know whether Trump uh, will announce that he might consider running again in four years. You know, that's what happened in 1820 when, when Andrew Jackson uh, ran against uh, John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy Adams literally in that case did steal the election from him. Uh, Jackson won overwhelmingly, and the electors uh, didn't give him enough votes. And so um, what Jackson did is he immediately started campaigning, um, calling it the corrupt bargain. He campaigned for four years, and then four years later he ran against Adams again, and he beat him overwhelmingly. That's a possibility. Who knows? Nobody knows what's in the mind. Uh, of President Trump. We know that uh, he is not your typical politician, so don't expect him to behave like a typical politician. Is it theoretically possible that if the, courts, if the court case drags on beyond January 20th, is it possible somebody can get sworn to be President of the United States and the courts find some irregularities that might invalidate the election? Is that theoretically possible? Theoretically possible, uh, January 20th, the term of the current president ends. There's nothing that can change that. A nuclear, God forbid, a nuclear attack couldn't have changed that. Uh, that's in the Constitution. But if there were challenges and the challenges went beyond that date, uh, you can imagine a situation, I think it's highly, highly unlikely, where a president might be sworn in. <laughs> there was a TV show a few years ago, you might remember, it called Designated Survivor where the theory is the president, everybody's killed in the Capitol, and this obscure secretary of health, education, and welfare takes over, and he's the president, he's sworn in, but it turns out somebody else survived who might have a better claim to the presidency. So, you know, these things are the stuff of fiction and novels and TV series, but in reality, I suspect that when the inauguration occurs on January 20th, that will be the president for the next four years. Juan in New Jersey, thank you for patiently waiting. Go ahead, Juan. You have a question for Alan Dershowitz. Hi, Juan. Um, hi, hi, Professor Dershowitz. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, you. I just had a question, and it's, you know, maybe it's an unfair question. Uh, sure. it, we're a veteran family, and, you know, when Ob I know you're a Democrat, and when Obama was in office, we lost, uh, that economy was so bad for us. You know, we lost a lot. Um, fast forward under Trump, we've gained everything back and more. And, you know, we're so stressed out about this election and the outcome. Um, when you look at some of the other states, not just Pennsylvania, do you see any wiggle room for President Trump where he can, where he can kind of um, keep hold of the presidency? I don't. I think it's unlikely. Uh, and your point, of course, about the economy, um, President Obama inherited a bad economy. There was a bad economy previously. And, um, you know, he he did a fairly decent job in bringing about a recovery. There's no question that President Trump, uh, the economy really, really uh, uh, succeeded under him. And even after COVID, uh, I think he did a pretty good job in bringing the economy back. Um, but you know, that's why Americans get to vote. Uh, a lot of Americans agree with you. Some disagree with you. Um, people thought he might win in the Rust Belt states, the Midwest states, because he's done a good job in the economy. But he ended up, you know, losing in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, although there are challenges going forward. But, you know, that's democracy. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you for your phone call. Okay, let's move on to Brad in the Bronx. Brad in the Bronx, uh, you have a question for Professor, please. Uh, yes, Professor Dershowitz. I have a question as to why something that to me seems very common sense, very simple, 
that would have prevented all of this controversy, why it wasn't done, prefacing it with saying, I think there are some very legitimate concerns that there were substantial numbers of fraudulent ballots in Pennsylvania, at least possibly in some of the other states. And my question is, why did not perhaps Attorney General Barr, simply because there were multiple Republican poll watchers in Philadelphia, in Milwaukee, that were physically prevented. In one case, I understand that one Republican poll watcher was locked in a closet for 20 minutes. So you're talking multiple cases of physical assault where Republican poll watchers were literally blocked physically, were literally thrown out physically in Philadelphia, in Milwaukee. So my question is, why did not Attorney General at that point simply order, whether it was uh, federal agents, whether they're FBI or federal marshals or both, to first escort the Republican poll watchers in, whether it was Philadelphia, Milwaukee. Okay, we got the gist of your question. I'll let the president okay. respond. The answer is very simple. This is a matter of state law, not federal law. If anybody were denying people the right to vote on the basis of race or on the basis of any other constitutional criteria, then the federal government, the attorney general, would have the power. But the attorney general doesn't really have the power under the Constitution to assure that elections are not fraudulent. That's something that's up to the state. You know, one can imagine a system in which there would be federal law which empowered the attorney general to uh, send in uh, federal agents to make sure that poll watchers were allowed to watch. But the idea that poll watchers can watch it all is a matter of state law and not federal law. So it's complicated. We live in a federalist society, and it's very complicated. Anyway, thank you for your phone call. Let's go to Ruben on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Okay, Ruben, your quick question. Oh, let, let's first take Stanley. He's been waiting for a long time. Stanley and Forest Hills, you're next. Go ahead, Stanley. Hello? S Stanley, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, go, go ahead, Stanley. Your quick Hello? Question. Yes, go ahead. What's your going quick, on? Your, your quick question. You hear me? Your, yes, we hear okay, you loud and clear. Okay. You're loud you hear me all right now? You're loud and clear. I do, yeah. Okay. Uh, counselor, uh, Justice... Uh, uh, Kavanaugh and the uh, Chief Justice, as well as uh, the new Justice, were lawyers in the case in 2000. Do you believe, yeah. and so now, if it goes to the Supreme Court, they will be judging the same type of case. Is there a conflict of interest? Should they recuse themselves if anything comes to the Supreme Court related to this? And you said it is political, but they've already done that before. Well, should they recuse themselves? Is it a conflict of interest? It's a very good question. Um, you know, they litigated issues for the Republican Party, not for this particular candidate, but for the Republican Party. And there could be a perception of a conflict of interest, but it's going to be up to the justices to decide whether or not the perception outweighs their obligation to sit and decide cases. Remember, if, if three people recuse themselves, the number of justices is down to six, and you're very likely to get a 3-3 vote. So I suspect, in the end, they will not recuse themselves. Henry Stanley, thank you for your question. Always good question, okay. as usual. Okay. Let us go to Ruben on the Upper West Side of... Ruben in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. You're going to be your... Ruben, it's going to be your turn the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Let me give out our phone numbers one more time. It's 212-769-1925, our number, extension 100. 212-769-1925. Our, our numbers, and uh, we are going to take uh, some more of your phone calls. But let's first break. We're going to be right back with our final stretch with Professor Alan Avi Dershowitz right after these measures. So don't go away. Stay tuned. Again, your phone call is 212-769-1925, extension 100. We're going to get some emails. I see a bunch of them coming in right now. Zevbrenner at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please become a fan of Talk Line with Zeb Brenner on Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, and YouTube. On Twitter at TalkLine Network, if you have an Android phone, please download our free app in the Google Store. For iPhones, download the Jewish Radio app. Of course, tune in 24 hours a day 
at TalkLineCommunications.com for nonstop Jewish broadcasting. Would you say, this is, here's an email from Ruvain. Are the Democrats more intolerant than the Republicans these days? Are they more what? Intolerant. I think in general that young people on the left are more intolerant than young people on the right. I hope that will change. It was different when I was growing up. But I think today on college campuses you see a lot more intolerance on the left, intolerance for free speech, intolerance for due process, intolerance in life. Look, I'll give you a story from my own life. I live on Martha's Vineyard in the summer, and we have a lot of friends here. I used to help them a lot, get to help get their kids advice about college. I would advise their kids if they got arrested. I would wake up in the middle of the night to uh, bail a kid out of prison, help a guy's father. But as soon as I decided to defend President Trump in front of the Senate, the people in Martha's Vineyard stopped talking to me. I joke that I've lost 15 pounds on the Trump diet because nobody invites me to dinner. And it's easy for me to socially isolate on the vineyard because nobody wants to talk to me. The intolerance that I've experienced on the vineyard for simply standing up for the Constitution and arguing my deeply felt belief that the impeachment of President Trump was unconstitutional has created an enormous amount of intolerance. My support for Israel creates an enormous amount of intolerance among people on the, on the hard left. And so, yeah, I think I would have to agree that today people on the left show a greater degree of intolerance than people on the right. That could switch over time. But right now, I think that's an accurate description. Okay, let's go to the Lisa. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly in Upper Manhattan. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, uh, Dershowitz uh, said that uh, Obama uh, received uh, a, a very bad uh, situation economically, and uh, I, I don't think it was as bad as uh, people say it was. First of all, uh, he criticized and brought down uh, uh, the uh, consumer confidence, and then when he was elected, uh, he, he continued it and even increased it and kept criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. So, you, so, your, point, so your point, your question is? My, my question is that I'd, li I'd like a, a, a comment uh, on why it isn't noticed that his uh, Obama did not. He drove consumer confidence down and therefore the economy got worse and worse. And uh, it wasn't as bad as uh, three three hundred and fifty billion. I'm going to let the, we're almost out of time. I'm going to let um, I'm going to let the professor respond yeah, to you. Look, yeah, I, voted you so for, I voted for Obama, but I was very critical of him. I was particularly critical of his views on the Middle East. I I wrote a book called The Case Against the Iran Deal. I railed against him for the Security Council resolution that he allowed to go through. Reasonable people could disagree about the economy. That's why we have elections. Um, you know, I regret my second vote for Obama. I, 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 I was proud to vote for him the first time. But I, I think in retrospect, I might have voted for Romney uh, over Obama the second time because Obama uh, really uh, did a terrible, terrible series of things in relation to Israel. And I worry very much about how Israel will do. Uh, you know, six new uh, six Congress people were elected this year to Congress from the Democrats that support the BDS movement. There's a guy running for the Senate in Georgia uh, who seems to be anti-Israel. He called Israel an apartheid country and said that the walls there are like the Berlin walls. So I worry about the Democratic Party and Israel. And for me, being a bipartisan means that you condemn the people you voted for when they do the wrong thing and you praise the people you voted against when they do the right thing. I did not vote for Donald Trump in 2000. 16, and yet I praised him over Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, the peace processes that are going on in the Gulf, and I will continue to do that. I'll are you happy that Joe praise. Biden won the election as opposed to Donald Trump? I, I have not commented on my personal views of the election. I've known Joe Biden for many years. I've known Donald Trump, um, but I'm not going to comment on who I voted for in this particular election. 
we'll wait and 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 see how he does. Um, I think he's a decent man. Here we go. Let's go to Ruben in Manhattan, patiently waiting. Go ahead, Ruben. Your quick question or comment to Professor Alan Dershowitz. Yeah, just a quick comment. I agree with the uh, Alan Dershowitz. I was going to call him Rabbi. Um, that the 92nd so Street, happy. the 90 Street, 92nd Street Y homepage has highlights AOC's picture. So you're, I absolutely agree with you that 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 organization is like off the off the wall. No, it's it's terrible. The fact that they highlight AOC and they wouldn't allow me to speak says something about where the establishment, you know, uptown Jewish community is going. I think the 92nd Street Y is a disgrace, a disgrace to the Jewish community, a disgrace to freedom of speech, a disgrace to everything that America stands for. And um, I have to tell you, if Elie Wiesel was still alive today, I believe he would refuse to speak at the 92nd Street Y because of the way they treated me, not allowing me to speak and censoring me. And I hope that other speakers who are invited to speak at the 92nd Street Y will say no. We're not going to do it. We're not going to speak at the 92nd Street Y if you prevent Alan Dershowitz from making pro-Israel arguments in front of your audience. A terrible situation. Ted and Forest yeah. Sills, we have a few moments left. Your quick question or comment. Go ahead, Ted. Ted and Forest Sills, are you there? Okay, if we don't have Ted. Uh, hello? Go ahead, Ted, yes. Yeah, uh, I remember him from the advocates. Uh, how can the uh, Democrats be uh, uh, c- a reconciliation when they were so thinking to President Trump? And there will be war. These people are weak, the, the uh, Chinese and the uh, um, Russians are looking for trouble. They will cancel the new bomber that's coming out to give it to the stinking poor who do nothing for the country. Anyway, I appreciate you call. We're almost out of time, so we're going to just take a couple more questions. Let's go to Al, very patiently waiting in Brooklyn. Go ahead, Al, in Brooklyn. Thank you. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, quick question. You mentioned earlier that you voted via mail. Um, Can you explain, as far as we've heard this on the news, as far as Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, how elected officials or election officials can accept ballots without any ID of any kind. There's no checking of signatures. There's no checking of IDs. They're just sending in ballots. It could be, and that's what Giuliani was saying, it could be coming in from Mars. Nobody knows who they are, where it's coming from, or things of that sort. I'm sure when you voted in Florida, you had to show some kind of proof of who you were. Well, when I registered in Florida, I had to show proof. But I think when I voted, they just sent me a ballot, and I checked in the ballot and I signed it under penalties of perjury, sent it back, then went online and checked to make sure that my ballot was received. Uh, But when I did register, when I moved from Massachusetts to Florida, I registered as a Florida voter and they did check me out. And uh, I think they should check everybody. Nobody should be allowed to vote who doesn't live in the place. And certainly dead people shouldn't be allowed to vote. The democracy requires that we have fair voting and fair voting requires checking and double-checking, and I hope that happens in every election. Good question. Thank you for that. Okay, let's go to Menachem of Maplewood, New Jersey. Go ahead. Your question. Yes, Professor Dershowitz, in your uh, storied legal career, have you ever passed on a case that you later regretted and that you wish that you had taken it on? And maybe you were... Maybe you were, you, uh, you were involved on the appeal maybe afterwards? I, I imagine there must be some I wish I had taken. I can tell you one I wish I hadn't. I wish I had never met Jeffrey Epstein any time <laughs> in my life. When I, first him, I was introduced to him by the Lady Rothschild. They said he was the friend of the president of Harvard, the friend of uh, the man who, uh, you know, the Hillel building in Harvard was donated by Jeffrey Epstein. I had no reason to doubt him. I never saw him in the presence of anybody inappropriate, but I wish I had never met him. I wish I had never come in contact with him. But most of the other cases that I've had, I'm, I'm proud of having done. But uh, when you're a defense lawyer, you don't defend only good people. You don't defend only innocent people. Just remember, what was it, last week or two weeks ago, uh, the, in, in the book of Reshit, uh, uh, Abraham argues with God. He's the lawyer for the people of Saddam. He certainly didn't love the people of Saddam, the sinners of Saddam. But he thought they needed representation, and he made the argument. So I don't compare myself to Abraham, but I do say that everybody's entitled to a lawyer, and so I will continue to represent people that a lot of people don't like. Some people love my clients. 
when I represent Natan Sharansky, people love me. When I represent Jeffrey Epstein or O.J. Simpson, people hate me. But that's part of being a criminal defense lawyer, and I'm very proud of my role of being a defense lawyer for 55 years. Good, good question. Thank you. Ron, we have 30 seconds. Ron from Upper Bronx, you're going to be the final caller tonight. Go ahead. Professor Dershowitz, yeah. quick, three questions. One question. We're the, out of time. Okay. How did the pollsters get it so wrong? How did who? The pollsters? The pollsters. You just can't rely on pollsters. Uh, whether or not they do it because it's wishful thinking or whether the science is wrong or whether in the case of Donald Trump, People just don't tell pollsters that they're going to vote for him, and then they vote for him. But the polls have been off in every election involving Donald Trump, and I think the pollsters have a lot of explaining. Good question. We have 30 seconds. This is a quick question from uh, Long Beach, New York. Not only many media, but even some nations and institutions are referring to Joe Biden as the president-elect. Israel did. Is it correct to call him president-elect? Because this will be adjudicated by the courts. It'll be adjudicated, first of all, by the states. The states have to certify. And then the courts, if there are challenges, it's a colloquialism calling him president-elect. He is not officially president-elect. The Secret Service regards him as president-elect. They have, you know, multiplied his uh, his, his uh, security. And I think people are just using We're out of time. I just want to tell people, I further want to thank you, Professor Alan Avi Dersh, who's made recommend people to hear your daily podcast, The Dersh Show, on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, the latest book, Guilt by Accusation. Thank you for joining us. Look forward to having you back. A pleasure. Thank you. Good. Shavuot Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. Thank you for tuning in to... Thank you for listening to TalkLine Communications Network, America's leading Jewish radio and TV network since 1981. This concludes Jewish programming for tonight. For continuous, non-stop Jewish broadcasting, please go right now online to TalkLineCommunications.com. For more information on all of TalkLine's Jewish radio and TV shows, please call 212-769-1925 or email info at TalkLineCommunications.com. Talk Line's new 24-hour day listen line is 712-770-0534. That's 712-770-0534. Listen online or in our listen line 24 hours a day. Enjoy. Thank you for listening.